morning. It is that time of the week. It is the favorite Tuesday I've had all weekend. It is time for the True Wealth Radio Show. I am your host, Dave Littlejohn. In studio today with me, Matt Dixon. And our special guest, nobody but us. Yeah. Yeah. So glad that we've got each other. So thanks for hanging out, Matt. I'm ready to go. Yeah. We have got an interesting question to pose today. Yeah. Right? And here's the question. Matt, mm -hmm. at what point have you put too much money into pre-tax or otherwise known as qualified retirement plans? I don't know that there's a necessary like an actual number that we can slap on there because it can kind of vary, right? But there surely is a number out there where it's like, maybe you've put too much in. So I kind of want to unpack that today. Right. I, I was waiting for him to say, it's $4. Good show. Let's. That's a wrap, yeah. right? But no, we're not going to do it. We're going to actually answer the question. If, you've, if you're wondering, how could you possibly think that you've got too much money in a retirement plan? So there's there's a funny funny element at play here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, help our listeners for a second. What is the what is the concern that we as advisors have about really big retirement plans? Maybe I'll try and oversimplify it. Right. Yes. Say you're in a twenty percent tax bracket today because you're deferring some of your income into a retirement account. All right. Sure. Pretty simple. What if you defer enough over a long enough period of time, you grow that retirement account substantially, and when you go to retire, you have to take out so much money that you have jumped into a higher tax bracket. So here's what, uh, there's, there's this critical piece some people do not know, and mm -hmm. that is that retirement plans, particularly these a qualified pre-tax plan. Like a traditional yeah, IRA. Traditional IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and so forth. The, the IRS will only let you defer money for so long before they start looking for you to pay taxes. Right. And that age has been changed, and but it's now currently... 73? 73. 73. Mm -hmm. And then you start to have what's known as a required minimum distribution. Right. So you have to take some yeah. portion of that money out of the retirement account. They force you to. Yeah, it's compulsory in nature. And how do they force you to? Well, if you don't do it, they tax you at 50% of what you should have taken out. It's a lot. Which is... So just take the money out. It's Yeah, and, and so that is higher than the highest marginal tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So they're essentially they're saying, we will make you pay the highest tax we have if you refuse to take money out of your retirement plan. Right. So now you have to think to yourself, wait a minute. What happens if I make more money in our current tax system? Well, yeah. we have what's known as a progressive tax system, which means very simply, the more you make, the higher your tax rate goes. Right, and it tops out around what, 30, 37% federal, federally? Yeah. Right? And you know that changes from time to time depending on administration, mm -hmm. right? So depending on the makeup of Congress and the White House, it, the, those tax rules can change and they have I certainly have throughout my you know, few decades working around this I guess well, more than two decades yeah. few makes it sound like more than three I haven't been doing this for 30 years right I'm in year 25 so it's been a while yeah. and I've seen a lot of tax changes mm -hmm. so here's the here's the rub right if you in retirement have a really big retirement plan then you're gonna have a really big required distribution, right. which will drive your tax bracket higher in because it's a yeah. larger distribution. Right. And here's another thing to think about. You just mentioned it, right? Policies change with different administrations. Yes. What has been a recent change that we've seen since Biden took office? The SECURE Act, right? Right. And that's a big deal because we're talking about like these IRAs growing to a, you know, a sizable amount and then you end up in a higher tax bracket, but we also got to think about what are the implications to the errors of those retirement yeah. accounts. Can, can I just for, for a sec, can I just hit pause on this one? Yeah. Because what I'd really like to do for for everybody listening, let me let me paint the 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 scene for a minute here. The IRS has kind of a an interesting w approach here. 
they typically do not tax something twice. Uh, there are a, a few scenarios where that kind of happens in theory because, uh, for example, dividends, first a corporation pays a tax and then distributes the dividend, which is then taxable again. Some would argue that's a double taxation. But uh, I'm, I'm talking about for you as an, an income earner or if you have a capital gain or something like that, the IRS typically views this as we tax the money once. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so now if the money gets paid to somebody else, they get to pay taxes on it. So it's not like the money's not taxed over and over again in the system. It is. Right. But I'm saying if you earn an income, you, you pay taxes at the point that you earn it. If you defer the tax, then you're going to pay taxes when the money gets undeferred. Right. Okay? And that's a funny way of saying when you take it out of that, that tax deferral. Well, if we think about the, so I, I like to think of it this way. The IRS kind of gets you on the way in or they get you on the way out. Mm -hmm. Okay? And retirement plans are usually a they get you on the way out deal. Right. Now, the magic of this, and we're not going to talk a ton about this today, it will hint about it, but would be Roth IRAs. Because there, you pay into a Roth IRA with money that's already been taxed. Mm -hmm. And this is a unique situation where that account is allowed to grow over time. And if it's qualified, and there are just a few things, and we're not going to go into great detail here, but essentially it's been longer than five years that the Roth has been open, and you're over age 59 and a half, then those monies should be qualified, meaning they're going to be able to be removed from the Roth IRA, and no tax is going to be owed. But wait, Dave, didn't you say that they get you on the way in or they get you on the way out? Well, the money that you've already been taxed on that makes sense that you wouldn't have to pay taxes again because they already taxed it. What about all the gains, mm -hmm. right? If, if, if you've grown that asset a whole lot, did you have to pay taxes on the profits? No. That's the unique thing about a Roth IRA. And here, what's another really unique feature? And this is why I asked you to hit pause, Matt. Okay. Heirs do not uh, have to That's pay. why you wanted me to hit pause. Yes. yes that is Be a big deal. Because... Heirs in, basically inherit the same tax status, mm -hmm. okay? And so when it comes to retirement plans, a Roth IRA, heirs inherit tax, Roth, they, they inherit, inherit the Roth tax-free. They still right. have to take the money out of the Roth, but and the current not, rules are within 10 years, right? Yeah. But they don't pay taxes on well, it. I ran into this issue, not with a Roth, but with the traditional. Um, I, I was talking with someone and they're like, yeah, I've got, you know, well, uh, it was, I think over two million dollars in an IRA and their children were both really well off making like two hundred plus thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. and they're like so what when I pass and this money goes into a beneficiary IRA for my kids now they're gonna have to take the money out and pay taxes on it but they're already making two hundred thousand a year and it started to make them sweat they're right. like Oh, it gets better. It's going to come up in this show even more. Okay. Okay. But when we talk about taxes and heirs, the first point to remember is if you're going to inherit the same tax issue, right, mm -hmm. then an IRA, traditional IRA that you've not paid any taxes on, you're, you hit age 73, you start having required distributions. Uh -huh. If you die and there's money in that IRA, your heirs, like if it goes to your spouse, they get it without owing taxes for receiving it, but they're going to have to make decisions about how old are they and when will their required distribution start. Mm -hmm. If it's a non-spouse, then a 10-year clock starts ticking and they have 10 years to get that money out. Right. Think about this for a second. If you inherit an IRA worth $5 million, okay. first of all, high five. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you for inheriting $5 million. Okay? High five. But you have 10 years to take this out. If that account didn't earn a penny more. Right, you just completely uninvest. You just, just, just put it in a savings account with zero interest. Mm -hmm. You'd have to take, if you did equal distributions, a half a million dollars a year for 10 years to get that money out of the account. Yeah. A half a million dollars added to your earnings is very likely to put you in the highest tax bracket possible, which is currently close to, so 39%, but you'll be well over 30% mm -hmm. at, at the federal level. In the state of Oregon, you'll be tacking on another 9%. So imagine 39% federal and 9% state in Oregon, so you've got 48% tax. 
Right. And so and you, if you're watching yeah. this show, by the way, and you're not in Oregon, then apply your own state tax circumstance. Right. But, but that's you're a saying bunch of taxes. You did so good. You crammed all that money into that IRA. Right. And then you're like, all right, I'm going to give this big gift. And then poof, almost half of it's gone. Right. And so and you, you never thought about it. Half of it goes to taxes. And you go, well, what was the point of that? If I was in a 30% tax bracket right. and I was deferring take the and I turned it into a 50% tax bracket in retirement, like, oh, yeah, you kind of broke it. You did. You could have just took the money as income and you would have... It would have it literally been cheaper yeah. because, believe it or not, the math works out pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, you know, you save the money on the way in or you save the money on the way out, but that's kind of how yeah. the tax brackets work. So we got to unpack this a little bit for everybody. There are some, some financial planning approaches to how to navigate how much should I be saving right and, and here's the here's the good news if you're like I don't know you're close to that okay then you don't necessarily have to worry about it now let's create that problem so we can worry about it okay right? let's do good that. problems to create too but some of you out there this is a real concern and so okay. and, and it may be a concern because you are the person that owns this IRA it may be a concern because you could be inheriting something like this from your folks because uh, you know we got a lot of folks that are now in their 80s and 90s and they've been deferring taxes for a long time and there's been a lot of stock market growth over the last few decades mm -hmm. so what does this mean oh well, I want to know yeah <laughs> as do I but first we have to take uh, an obscene profit break. okay so let's do it we're gonna do that stick around and when we come back we will unpack this a little bit more uh, I'm Dave Littlejohn and Matt Dixon and you got true well on news radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN So, the moral of the story is when we went to figure out how to do this show today, this is based on a Dave Ramsey scenario. <laughs> and and uh, I was sort of jammed up with clients. Jam just makes it sound bad, but I mean, I was, I was doing a lot of face to face time with clients. So Matt was doing show prep, and he comes in, we got to talk about this. And it started with Dave Ramsey was struggling with this one because this guy did. He had the, his example, he's 66 years old, and he has like $7 million in different tax deferred accounts. And the question is, what do you do? And, and it was, uh, do you just, and we're going to talk about this on the rest of the show. Do we just like, convert everything to Roth, pay taxes? and be done with it, kind of rip the band-aid off, um, do you, uh, well, he didn't really talk about the idea of staggering conversions and spreading the uh, tax pain out a little bit, but there, there are some decisions around that. And then he didn't talk a whole lot about estate planning other than to say, the longer you defer this, the more it keeps growing, the more the tax obligation grows too. So I think what we're going to try to unpack today in the rest of the show is how do you recognize that this is a potential problem as an investor? Because I think that's really the key here is if you've got retirement plans, I mean, they're great. They exist for, for reasons. It's a, it's a good way to save. Uh, but at the same time, you reach this threshold of like it may be diminishing marginal return and it's time to start looking at other areas of the balance sheet that may be more tax advantageous. Right? And we'll see how far we get on the show, right? We're going to have to recap the first part. Um, got a client listening and they want they want a, they want a, recap uh, a slight have, recap because this one can be interesting goods. for them yeah yeah we we have a client <laughs> and we have somebody who also said how much money forty two dollars that's how much if, if you have forty two dollars in a retirement account okay you're, you're in trouble that's yeah classic. so a brief recap to catch everyone up to speed that missed the first part of the show hey you're in charge no oh come on. You're, you're mr speed i'm giving you Turn this on and I'll, I'll enter it. Right. Hey, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. In studio with me today, Matt Dixon. Dave, uh, catch up the listeners who are just tuning in. What are we talking about yeah, today? You're, you're, and by the way, you can get the whole show by going to the podcast. It'll be available tomorrow. Go to littlejohnfs.com and you can grab that. Uh, be sure to subscribe. And then uh, at some point, we get these up on YouTube as well. Uh, Newsflash as well, we are planning on adding a live stream soon. So we're working through that, but that, that'll be fun. Uh, for those of you just joining, here's the key. Uh, the question of the day, at what point have you put too much money into retirement plans? Mm -hmm. okay? And it's a it's a funny thing, like, wait, I can put too much in? 
It's not that you put too much in. The question is, like, at what point is it diminishing marginal or return? Or at what point is it actually harming your financial picture? Well, at what point does it generate more tax than it saves? That's, That's really the question. That's a better way to save it. That's a better way to <laughs> yeah, save it. Yeah, because if you, if you find yourself saying, hey, I am in a lower tax bracket today, but I'm saving myself into a retirement that puts me in a higher tax bracket than today, then you're making it less well, efficient, and not it more. it might be, act, like, actually easier to do than you think. It might not be as much money as you think either. Yeah, so we did uh, uh, we did do a little bit of swag sort of, math. It was swag <laughs> math. Um, so do we just give them the number and then tell them why or do we well, tell them what we did? Tell them, start with kind of like how we even got to this point. Like what brought it up? How did we start running the numbers and where did we end up? Yeah, it started with, uh, we saw a clip from Dave Ramsey. We did. Okay. Yeah. And so this this guy is calling in and he says, hey, I've got kind of a weird problem. I have all of these retirement plans that are tax deferred and I've got over $7 million in retirement plans. Mm -hmm. I'm 66 years old and I see the writing on the wall. I'm going to head toward age 73, have required distributions and the required distributions are going to be so large that it's going to put me in the highest tax bracket and it's going to sort of blow stuff up. Yeah. And then he's like, what do I do? I've got some time, right? And right. Dave's over there like, uh, maybe not as much time yeah. as you actually need to and, fix and, this and, problem. And it was, it was <laughs> kind of fun to watch because there's a little bit of tap dancing. Where there Dave was. Dave did like, well, here's some of the math. I'm like, right, it's a problem. And then it was this head scratcher. Um, I'll tell you how we would sort of approach solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you guys can reverse engineer this number so you get a sense of, am I on course to run into that problem or not? Okay. okay. Perfect. So. You know, first thing first is, are you going to run into the problem? Okay. Well, the the number as we we looked at this is like, well, what's future tax rate versus present tax rate? Mm -hmm. okay. And we actually looked at the the tax table and said, you know, at what point are you jumping up into that higher echelon in the 30s? Yeah. And so yeah. we started with, if you're married right now and you have more than a hundred and ninety one thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars in tax year 2024. Right. Of taxable income. Taxable income. Yeah. And keep in mind that's adjusted gross income. So that's after other deductions and so forth. But if yeah. you have that much income, then every dollar above that threshold is going to be taxed federally at 32%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you make more money than that, well, do some math here. Uh, the, the way that the IRS looks at this is they have what they would call their uniform distribution table. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's published. It's a fancy word of saying at what rate are they going to require you to take RMDs? Yeah. yeah. Essentially, when you're 73, what they're going to tell you to do is, hey, take the account value at the end of the last tax year, and then you're going to you're going to divide it by a factor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, like the factor at age 73 is presently 26.5. Right. So that's so. Let's say I have a million dollars. Divide a million dollars by 26.5, and the number that results is the required amount that you have to pull out of your retirement plan. For the year. For the year, yep. okay? And you can take it out over, you know, spread it out over a little bit each month, you can take it all at once, whatever you want, but but that's the money that's gonna be required to come out, mm -hmm. okay? And in the following year, that distribution number isn't gonna be 26.5. It's gonna be slightly smaller. Yeah, it drops, but what happens is you're dividing by a smaller number, which means the distribution gets bigger. And I think uh -huh. it's 25.5 in the next year. Mm -hmm. and, and But these are all tables that you can look up, and these tables occasionally change. Right. right? Depending on, like we said earlier in the show, legislative change. Yep. Right. So what you can see is every year you're going to be required to take a larger portion of the account balance out. Right. And for, to say, say it easy, if you have a bunch of money in that retirement account and they keep telling you take more out, you could end up in a really, really high tax bracket. Yeah, so the, the, yeah. the Dave Ramsey guy, right? I mean, yeah. if we say, well, hey, you have $7 million, right? and his factor was about 3%, right? Well, that's $60,000 per million, and he has $7 million, right? Mm -hmm. So that's $420,000 distribution. Right. Okay, remember, if you have more than $191,950 and you're married, then you're in the 32% federal tax bracket and climbing. Mm -hmm. Well, at that income level, and if you had any social security or pension income, which he did, right, right, then 
you're pushed even higher. So he's in somewhere like 37 to 39% tax bracket. He maxed it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, well, or, or at least close to I mean, the number's yeah. pretty high. You can yeah. make up to over $600,000 before you actually hit the, the top tax bracket right now, which is very high, right? right? Uh, but, but nevertheless, he saved his way into a tax conundrum. And there wasn't an easy way to reduce his tax load. Right, because... <laughs> The, the taxes are going to be paid, mm -hmm. okay? There, there's kind of two pathways that you tend to solve this. It is either just sort of suck it up and pay when it finally gets here, or try to convert some of the traditional IRA money into Roth IRA money. Right. That comes with a whole other host of issues. We talked about it on the show before, but when you do a conversion, remember one of the qualifying features of a Roth IRA is it has to live for five years. Right. And a conversion is treated like a standalone Roth. Mm -hmm. So even though you may already have another Roth IRA. Every, every time you convert. Every time you convert, that money gets a new five-year clock, separate from your other Roth IRAs if you have and them. And then you're paying income on the conversion. And piece. that's correct. The ta it is a taxable event to convert. The benefit may be, and, and here's where we differed from Dave Ramsey a little bit. He, his suggestion was, you know, just maybe bite the bullet and just pay the taxes all right now, mm -hmm. one and done, and then move forward. We think there's some actuarial risk, right? If you're 66, while you're likely to live into your 80s, if something were to happen immediately after that, you would have overpaid on taxes relative to the time span that your heirs would have had. So, mm -hmm. so that was not necessarily a great idea. Plus, you would have the five-year clock uh, for everything all at once. Right. So then we started thinking we may be more inclined to spread it out over several years and just try to maintain a lower average tax bracket right. and get money out of traditional IRAs mm -hmm. to lower that required distribution. And so this is a process that advisors would we would mostly call it like Planning. Roth conversion optimization. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, it's not a super se sexy topic. No. Right? It's like, wait, you mean to tell me I have to pay taxes to not pay as many taxes? The unfortunate Kinda. part for that guy, though, was if he had been doing a little bit more planning or help, getting some help along the way, he might have been able to have avoided putting it all in one basket, right? Like, mm -hmm. he might have been like, well, I have enough in there at this point. Let's just take the income or let's put the money somewhere else. And then he wouldn't be in the, the pickle that he's in. Right. And so this is something that we do sort of struggle with in the advisory world that um, you don't know what the future tax rates are going to be. Right. We have to make reasonable assumptions or even assume that they're not going to change. Right. Like it's, it's actually possible. I know this is going to sound crazy, right? It's possible based on sort of the, the political trendings right now, Donald Trump gets elected and reinstitutes different tax policy that's lower, at least at a corporate rate, mm -hmm. right? And so there are possible changes on the horizon. There's always possible changes well, on the horizon. And I don't know if it's even, or how possible it is, but if the SECURE Act did go away and then beneficiaries didn't have to take that money out in 10 years. Yeah, then that would be a significant change too. Even it just would. extending it to 15 or 20 years would really impact planning it for would. people. Yeah. Cause my, my concern would be, that, you know, if you inherit a big IRA and you only have 10 years to get it out, you're going to be forcing people into higher tax brackets. And that's I mean, what's happening. It, it does make sense from the IRS perspective, mm -hmm. right? They're sure. like, we're hungry, give us more, right? It's just frustrating from a planning perspective because my position is that we already uh, you, pay, we, yeah. uh, well, you know, I would say, I'm thankful we don't get all the government we pay for, but man, do we pay a lot of, for a government. Yep. Right? I mean, there's just a lot of money that goes into the kitty, and, um, you know, I'm not trying to pick on the people that work in government. I think we have a lot of people that are genuine, like, they're really trying hard to make it right. Um, I just think the system is, it's hard to make a really big system not be bureaucratic and bloaty and slow and cost mm -hmm. inefficient over time, and, and there's not really incentives to lean government. Right. There's no internal incentives for government to prune itself. So why would it? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of tricky, right? I mean, the private sector has lots of incentive. You know, margins are profit. So it, it, it looks to prune when it can. But government doesn't 
have to think the same way a lot of the time. David, let me ask you a question. So going back to what we were talking about, mm -hmm. we kind of started to mention what are some of the other things that this guy could have done in order to have, you know, if it's not going to be that IRA, where else could he have gone, right? And so do we want to talk about that at all? Like what are some of the other options that this guy could have taken advantage of? I know, I was, I was smiling and laughing, uh, which you, uh, mostly smiling. Our listeners don't get to see that as much. I know what you're doing, Matt. What am I doing, David? Go ahead and just expose it. No, he's So, when we're prepping for the show, I look at him and go, you know, there's kind of an exotic way that you can sort of reposition things and you know shift your investment focus elsewhere and, and sort of change the characteristic of your taxes, and it would be way more efficient. And he looks at me and goes, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I always want to know that part. I think everyone does, right? Like, uh, Okay. So, I mean, you know as well as I, I'm not a huge fan of life insurance as a whole, right? right. Like, I, term policies, sure, I get it. Um, those have a time and place for sure, but could this guy have used life insurance? Could he have, like, gone into real estate? I just kind of want to pick your brain on where could he have gone, how could he have done it, and... Maybe, All right, yeah. I'll do this. I... I'll let you drive some of this. I know you've got some ideas and questions that Lots we of want questions. That for our, I mean, you know, Matt's, Matt knows a lot of this stuff. Just don't, don't let him fool you. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, he's doing this on purpose. It's like, <laughs> no, no, I just want to interview you. And so he's sort of setting me up and that's why I'm chuckling about this. Cause I'm like, you're going to do this, aren't you? And he's like, Oh, it's happening. Are you turning it back around on me? No, I'm not okay. going to do that. I am going to say, I, I'm just, I'm looking at the clock. Why don't we do this? We're running long already. We'll, we'll grab we'll grab our next break. Okay. When we come back, this for again, if if you're trying to figure out, hey, if I'm starting to reach the threshold where maybe it's enough in retirement, what else? Okay? Yeah. And so we'll unpack some ideas. It's not advice, but some concepts, and it'll be enough that at least we'll stoke the fires of interest for you. So stick around. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn and Matt Dixon. Got true wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN. Bingo. We've got a problem. We need a solution. Yes. Yeah. So alcohol is a solution. <laughs> drink you can dissolve your, all kinds of Drink your today. tax problems away. Oh, we were talking about different things now. Uh, water's a solution also. <laughs> so, um, Hydroplane or whatever it's called yourself. So I guess I am... I, I'm... I'm Making sure that I'm reading the your your cues here. You want to talk a little bit about um, real estate, and then how. Not even. That and then the life insurance thing has come up mm -hmm. somewhere. What's driving the life insurance question? It's on the list. <laughs> I was like, because it has Roth conversions, setting up a trust, using life insurance. I'm like. Could he have used a whole life policy, even though we don't love whole life policies? Well, could he now? Probably not as easily, but could yeah. he have? That's what I'm saying. In the yeah, yeah, he could. And and I hate even mentioning it because I don't like whole life policies. But I'm like, if we're on the topic, so we can talk a little bit about some specialty life insurance concepts, and then it's what's going to happen is it's going to be okay. So you either I have to see us after class, yeah. right? Let's go that route. Or you have to find somebody who's qualified to help you navigate this because we're going to get into advanced market concepts. But honestly, life insurance is like the, the last hope against the IRS. Mm -hmm. Life insurance I would basically gets to walk and talk like retirement plans. Wouldn't you rather just take it as income and just put it in a brokerage account? It depends on how you take it. That's what... <laughs> oh, gosh. Someone put a filter on me. I'm about to get canceled. Yeah. You <sighs> can't say that on the radio. I mean, you can, but people will question. <laughs> we get 17 clients tomorrow. They're we like, like those guys. Like, that is really I was reading off the teleprompter. That's said what we were thinking. <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, had a Ron Burgundy moment. 
<laughs> if you put it on there, go read it. <laughs> I will. I literally will. Uh, Did Justin ever tell you all the time him and I were doing a radio show? And <laughs> we were at break, and he's like, okay, I know where this show's going. There's one thing we cannot talk about. You cannot ask me about this. And it was something to do with, I don't even remember. I'm like, okay, I got you. And we opened the radio show, and this was like when I was newer, and I got nervous or something, and I'm like, so just, and I just blurted it out. And he's like, he sits up, from, he's just kind of mundane, he's like, and he just wanted to murder me, like jump over the computers and just knives. After that segment was over, we cut to the break, and he's like, how? It was the one thing you weren't supposed to talk about. You had one show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Welcome back to the True Well Show, uh, <laughs> at where we're well, we're having fun in studio today. I'm your host, Dave Little John, and Matt today? Dixon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, reminder: If you're just joining us, today's topic uh, is: Is there such a thing as putting too much money into a retirement plan? Yes. And the, our position is that yeah, there can be if it it, it creates tax inefficiency. Right. right. If you drive yourself into a higher tax bracket in the future than you are now, then why the retirement plan is not the right solution. Yep. Okay. And then you kind of asked me, Matt, what else might there be? Yeah. And so you, you've got a couple. Set the table for our listeners. Like, what are some ideas that you've kind of read about? And let's yeah. talk about them. Well, we already talked about the big one, right? We talked about the Roth conversion. Okay. okay. So and just just a reminder to everybody, you know, this Roth IRAs. They are, you fund them with after-tax money, and then they grow tax-free, and once they're qualified, they, the distributions are tax-free. Also tax-free to heirs. So Big if you have one. a traditional IRA, you can turn it into a Roth IRA through a process known as conversion. But you have to pay the taxes when you do it, and you have to, be like the taxes, it becomes income, right? Oh, I have $100,000 in a Roth account. If I take 100000 and convert it, I have to pay income tax on $100,000 when I convert, mm -hmm. okay? And so let's say I'm in a 30% tax bracket, then $70,000 is left in my investment account, but it's no longer a traditional IRA, it's a now a Roth IRA, and it will grow tax deferred, and once it's qualified after five years and re attained age and all that, then you can take that money tax-free or your heirs get it tax-free, mm -hmm. right? So that's the conversion thing that we keep talking about. Right. Okay, but what else? That's so the if, question. If we're talk yeah, so if we're talking about mitigating some inheritance issues, the other thing, I mean, this is simple, right? But, and I know I've already mentioned it, you could just take the income and put that money into like a brokerage account or a savings account. And so invest outside of a retirement plan. Exactly, because here's why. If you put that money, say in a brokerage account, and you invest in XYZ stock, maybe you hold it for a year or longer, what happens when you go to sell it and there's a gain? Now we're being taxed at long-term capital gains, which is approximately 10 to 12%, depending on... Depends on your total yeah. income level. Right. It goes as high as 20%. Sure. That's still cheap. Like if you're paying 20%, yeah. it's because your income tax rate's like, 39. You know? mm -hmm. So wouldn't you rather pay that than 30 plus percent? I would. Right. Yeah. So it, it does change uh, uh, things for heirs also. Yeah. Because heirs receive a step up in Ooh. basis. That's a big one. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah. It's just a really fancy way of saying heirs receive the thing as if they bought it the day that they inherited it. Right. Not for the price that you paid for it when you bought it but the value on the day that they inherited. That's okay? a really big deal. So, and that's why we start to talk about gifting stuff. People always have that question. Should yeah. I gift it now? And it's like, well, if they never plan to sell the thing that you're gifting, maybe. If it's real estate and it's a family heirloom of some sort, where it's like, yeah. this is the family farm. I have farm. a real life example. We have a family farm. Yeah, My that's a great example. My brother is like seventh generation. Mm -hmm. And so it's something where it's, and, and he wants to raise his family there. It's actually sensible for that farm to be gifted to him mm -hmm. now because it's probably going to stay in the family and his kids are going to take it. Right. So if, if that's the case, then there's no need to wait for parents to die for that to happen. They can gift it now and it still you know, makes sense because if he's not going to sell it, it doesn't matter what his... 
cost, cost basis, basis yeah. is, right? Right. But let's say that there's no attachment to a home and it's just going to go into the you know community pot and it's going to get sold someday. Mm -hmm. Gifting it but while you're still alive is gifting the price you bought it for. Right. And if they bought the family farm seven generations ago for... <laughs> well, whatever the case, yeah. let's say it was a house in California that was purchased 40 years ago, right? Oh, so yeah. So it's like, great, you know, we bought a house for $100,000 and today it's worth $2 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's $1.9 million of capital gains, but if you didn't gift it, when you die, the heirs receive it as if it was fair market value of $2 million. Right, so it's a big question, depending yeah. on what is the heir actually going to do. Yeah, and incidentally, this falls under the category of estate planning. Mm -hmm. If you've ever wondered, like, what, what the heck is estate planning? It's the idea of, well, estate is all the stuff you own, and it's... How do I transfer the stuff that I own to the next generation when I'm gone and do so in a clear and clean and efficient manner, mm -hmm. right? With minimal cost for transfer and minimal tax impact. That's yep. what estate planning is all about. Sure. And I guess we're kind of working our way down the totem pole, aren't we? So we've talked about some different strategies. Yeah, some, some of the Roth conversions. Yeah, stuff. and, and hinting like at gifting has really very yeah. little to do with our original question of no, like, but we did what, talk about the brokerage account. account. Yeah, we talked about retirement. the Roth conversions. We yeah. talked about the brokerage accounts. Brokerage, I guess we again, got it. That's like just don't Let's invest in retirement plans. That's yeah. really what you're saying. Right? Yeah, and then even for me, lower on the totem pole, maybe we talk about life insurance a little bit. Yeah, this is just one of the most dangerous. It, exi it exists, so yeah. I feel like we have to mention it. Otherwise, you know, we're not yeah. kind of covering all the the options here for this guy. Yeah, life insurance generally has two purposes generally okay mm -hmm. the two purposes that i see are take your money and make the insurance company rich mm, no, <laughs> oh, no 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 <laughs> no kind of uh, <laughs> so the life insurance is supposed to be to replace income yeah like somebody was counting on your income mm -hmm. and it's not there because you're dead right so it's to replace what you would have earned to take care of somebody that's number one Mm -hmm. Number two is estate liquidity. Because if you die and you have a bunch of property and you don't want to have it sold, but you have to pay taxes on it, life insurance can pay the tax bill. Okay? So it's useful for estate planning in that respect. Okay. There's a third use for it, which is sort of a getting creative and leveraging tax law. Ooh, I like it when we can pull levers. Right. So life insurance plays by a unique set of rules whereby you can put money into an insurance contract and it can grow tax deferred. Because okay. it's an insurance product. Because it's an insurance product. Now, annuities are also insurance products. But let's talk specifically about life insurance. Because this is something that is possible, and I'm going to be very clear when I say this. This is not a recommendation. Yeah, this is not a recommendation, it's not advice. This is advanced market stuff, and this is definitely a see me after class for your specific use cases. And if it's not me, then please see a qualified life insurance professional, right? Not just a salesperson, someone yeah, has access the big to, piece. Yeah. They they access to, to like advanced markets and case design for this kind of stuff. Yeah. But life insurance, there's you can get life insurance that can be overfunded, meaning you're gonna buy more, you're gonna put more premium in than the insurance that you're paying for, and you can store up cash value in the life insurance, and it can grow tax deferred, just like retirement plans. There are ways to suppress the cost of insurance on you. Mainly, you can insure more than one life. So it can be a joint life policy. For example, husband and wife. So you can get a second to die life insurance policy, which has lower actuarial costs than an individual. Mm -hmm. And it spreads the risk out. So if you happen to have like a less desirable insurance profile, you're hard to insure, well, you might still be able to get insurance with a second to die policy. Overfunded, it will grow a bunch, theoretically, and that money can be accessed in the form of policy loans. Okay, you take the loan out, and just like if you took an equity loan out, it's not income, so it's not taxable anywhere, according to the IRS as we understand it. And if you then die, the loan is paid back by the death benefit. 
and whatever is left, if there's additional death benefit that exceeds so, the loan, it will still go to heirs tax-free. So you're kind of giving yourself almost a line of credit in yes. a way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are lots of gotchas in there. Right? Yeah, and we don't have time to get into yeah, this. And that's not the point of this. The point is to say there are some very clever things that you can do. Same story if you have an illiquid estate. Like you can use borrowed money to buy life insurance. Now you're getting into really sophisticated case design. But for the scenarios where it works, it works really well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So things like bank owned life insurance, they call it bowling. Okay. It, it, it's, it's, all of this stuff requires specific legal navigation. That's why it's not advice. I'm just telling you a good financial planner and you know good legal counsel can help structure something if you are in a high net worth and highly illiquid situation. So those things kind of work out. Right. Now, back to home base. There are other things that you can do. I'm so dizzy after that, David. I don't yeah. even remember where home base is. We were asking what could you do if you if you're starting to kind of tap at the door of maybe maxing out the value of your retirement plan. Ah, there it is. And so we, we were saying, well, instead of investing in more in a retirement plan, you could look at things like non-retirement type of yeah. assets, brokerage, yep. insurance. The other big one, and I'll just, I'll say what it is and we'll take a break and we'll unpack it, is real estate. Mm -hmm. like, real estate is a, a very interesting asset because the characteristics uh, can they can have both. It's, it's basically it's like a business, right? It can have income, it can have expenses, it can have depreciation, and it can, in certain circumstances, change some types of cash flows if it has other businesses to partner with, and you're the owner. So now it's interesting getting interesting. Numbers. David, it's getting interesting, but look at the time. We have to take our last break. All right, let's do it and let's get back. Okay, we'll do that when we come back. We'll talk about some big picture ideas for real estate. I'm gonna tell you this, we're not gonna be able to make you an expert in 10 minutes, but we'll help you get dangerous. Stick okay. around, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You got True Well on News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN. I like it. Well, there is. Tell me something. Start your weekend at what do I need to tell you? How awesome we are. <laughs> <laughs> Who's texting you? No one. Oh, clients have given up. They're like, this show is taking way too long. You, you put Dave off in the weeds about their insurance and... I don't think we've actually gotten in the weeds on this show. No, I think we tried to stay on home base. But I think we've got machetes in each hand and we're just fighting our way through the jungle. Lacking. Yeah. It's amazing how much is in the topic when you start to unpack it. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you think, am I going down a rabbit trail? Not really. I mean, mm -hmm. it's relevant. It's just, it's, com it's so complex. many layers. It yeah. Is. yeah. You know, it, this is the thing, right? In the simplest terms, like at the end of the day, if you were to boil the show down, the question is, you know, what point is trying to defer taxes today? not going to create a superior benefit tomorrow. That's it, right? Like, like yeah. if, if I try to do something, but it actually makes it worse and not better, then stop doing that. And then the question is, well, where do you go from there? And so we've talked about insurance is kind of a weird avenue. In certain circumstances, it works, not always, right? I, I don't like the insurance guy that, like, the old joke, if everything's a, if all you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. It's like, I sell insurance, which means <laughs> insurance can solve every problem. Like, eh, I'm not that guy. Um, insurance has its place. Like I'm not going to demonize it. I'm just going to say, be aware, right? But after tax investing, right? Sometimes you just pay the taxes, and what's left, you try to be a good steward with it, and do good, good with that. And there are pros and cons to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then the last one, then this is what we're going to talk about. I think a lot of people really want to know this, and financial advisors tend not to go there, is the concept of real estate and what that means. And I think specifically rental real estate. Um, Although there are, you know, there are people that will just buy land, there's people that develop and, and so forth. So real estate's you know, a huge topic in and of itself, but we're gonna talk about that now. Okay. We're gonna have a lot of good content out of this show. Right. 
Hey gang, welcome back to the home stretch of the True Wealth Show. Uh, I'm your host Dave Littlejohn, with me today in studio. Some guy that's just spouting stuff off. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Uh, so today's primary topic is what happens if you find yourself in a circumstance where you've put so much money in retirement plans that the future tax benefit starts to diminish or even go backwards. So like you're, you're going to be in worse shape tax-wise in the future because your retirement plan has grown to a point that your future required distributions are going to drive your income into a higher tax bracket than it is today. So you need to pivot, mm -hmm. right? And so if and that's the case, where ways, do we yeah. pivot to? We, we kind of scratch the surface of insurance. We scratch the surface of after-tax investing in things like brokerage accounts using stocks and bonds and you know fairly mainstream financial instruments. But you know we haven't talked about yet. What is that? Real estate. Ah. Right? This is one that everyone loves because most people kind of understand it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I think generically we all see a lot of this. I mean, there's, there's a handful of types of real estate that I'll say, you know, you've got residential real estate. It's like, you know, if, whether it's your home or it's a rental property for somebody else to live in, you've got um, bare land. Mm -hmm. and, and, and or like you know, the, the land is not to develop, develop, so yeah. developable property and then um, commercial property mm -hmm. right and largely they I mean they walk and talk similarly in many cases but some the strategies can be a little different sometimes the uh, regulations are different with what you're dealing with you know and even residential like then you get into kind of specialty like hotel space or the short-term rental space and, you know, mm -hmm. that's all kind of a, a different flavor of real estate right um, commodity stuff like we don't talk a lot about, we think, oh, bare land, but what about land with timber on it mm -hmm. or mineral rights or something like that? So there's layers to this stuff, right? Sure. Here's the thing. Um, personally, uh, while I'm not advising everybody to do this, I think real estate is an, uh, a, a like, fairly important part of a financial strategy because it tends to be a good diversifier against the stock market, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're not super highly correlated, especially if real real estate, like physical, tangible, like you own either dirt or houses or something like mm -hmm. that. You're not owning a derivative instrument of real estate. Uh, here's stuff that people don't think about. Um, if you're a business owner, for example, you can own real estate and then have a separate entity, a separate business. Like, so if you may have a, an entity that owns real estate and then you may have a business that you run and the business can rent the real estate from you. Right? We, we yeah. forget that you can wear both hats as uh, you can own two different entities and those entities are allowed to rent from each other, mm -hmm. right? And the benefit of that is that it can change the cash flow, right? A business that pays rent expenses the rent and then the entity so that has the real estate the, receives yeah. rent, but rental income is a form of passive income instead of active. It has a different type of tax treatment. And so you, you're sort of converting cash flow by moving it th from one organization to another and you own both. Mm -hmm. So clever financial planners and clever CPAs can find ways to leverage the tax code to help you move money efficiently through the ecosystems. It's legal, right? I'm not talking about doing things that are shady here. It, it, if you're doing this properly, it's 100% above board. It's a known strategy. Uh, it's not a loophole. You, you really do have an entity renting from another entity and paying you know fair market rates, but it it's a way to manage the way cash moves through all of the organizations for business owners. Mm -hmm. And if you think about real estate as a business, right? Like if you own rental properties and you have people living in your properties, you're receiving income in the form of rent. You have expenses in the form of maintenance and potentially mortgages. And then you have the tax management of depreciation and so forth. Pair that with if you have a day job and W-2 income or even a separate business. And these are financial moving parts, but when properly coordinated, they can become more efficient. Right, I think that's worth mentioning. Yeah, that's kind of the, the trick, because I told Matt, I'm like, you know, if somebody's clever, you rent one entity to get started, and then you start bringing in cash flow from tenants, and. Um, you start accelerating depreciation in that building in order to offset some of the income so that you can then buy another building to increase the total income of your real estate portfolio 
and then get a new package of depreciation assets to work with to offset income, and then buy more. And you start you working buying your way up the yeah. Yeah, it's it's more or less of developing a portfolio of real estate by getting real estate to help you buy more real estate, with tax savings accelerating the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, does it require like intentional strategy? Yeah, it does. It really does. But if you're willing to put in the work and get to understand it a little bit, or you get a CPA to help you out along the way? Yeah, I think qualified professionals around you and then doing this uh, intentionally, mm -hmm. right? It's like you develop a business plan for it, okay? And the people that are successful in real estate that I know, they generally have a plan and they generally stick to the things that they know. Some people, they just buy a lot of single family homes and they, they own lots of homes and they rent them to people. And you know, I, I know people like their goal is to buy a home every year. Mm -hmm. Right? And just get it rented and get it going. Here's the trick. When you have one home, it's either rented or it's not. When you have two homes, they're not very often that both of them aren't rented. Mm -hmm. If you have a hundred homes, the probability that a hundred homes are not rented, very low. So it almost gets easier the more that you have. Yeah. Well, it gets more predictable. Right? That's, I guess that's a better word. You yeah. definitely get more headaches because you have more moving parts, mm -hmm. but you also have more revenue and you can sort of get people to help you because you're really running a business now. Yeah. You're running a business of rental properties. Mm -hmm. okay. But businesses get to do different things than uh, being just an employee. Right. right. And it, look, if you're just a really highly compensated employee and you can get you know, millions of dollars into a retirement plan, great. But you know, if you're making millions of dollars, at some point you're gonna, we're probably still gonna tell you, you may wanna you know, lay off on the retirement plan and look at other assets to invest in because it's just not in your best long-term strategic interest to keep piling money into a tax-deferred environment. All right, so David, what I want you to do with these last minutes that we've got, kind of sum this up and give people a takeaway. We've, we've thrown a lot of numbers around, so what do you got for them? The big takeaway from today. For me, it's you actually can put too much money in a traditional IRA. Yeah, I think yeah. You, I, you you can overinvest an IRA to the point that it you diminish or you water down the benefit. Right, and if someone needs a second opinion on that, reach out, get some qualified help, or if you feel like you're getting too close to that threshold, yeah, you can call you, us and we yeah. can kind of help you, you know, do some of the the math around it and. Um, help you figure it out. Uh, yeah, how do they call us, Matt? Well, give us a ring at 541-375-0898, or you can just chat us on the website. The website is littlejohnfs.com. Yeah, and I think that's the key takeaway. Sometimes this stuff, it gets complicated, and if you, know, if you have the problem of high account balances in your retirement plans, then you know, we're happy to help you how we can. Um, or you know, reach out to your advisor, make sure that they know what the heck that's going on too, because yep. they should know this stuff, right? It's part of their job, so anyway. Well look, I'm listening to the music, we're out of time, so we better run. Until next time, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, call us, 541-375-0898. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You got True Wealth. On News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.